and we are live and recording huzzah hello everyone and a very happy monday and we have a very amazingly awesome book to get to celebrate with you for a monday so it is my pleasure to get to introduce fran wild who for my screen is on the opposite side and she is going to be a win conversation with jonathan mayberry who is in the middle right here and the book in question that we are celebrating today is the ship of stolen words which quite literally does actually celebrate the power of words in a very cute and awesome way and i'm not gonna of course give away any spoilers but we have a protagonist with a sword of sorry that lets him get away with quite a bit if i do say so mm -hmm. um but then said sword is stolen by goblins and an adventure ensues upon which he tries to get back the sword and you'll just have to read and keep listening to see what else happens. But to give you a tiny little info on our authors, Fran Wilde is the award-winning author of Riverland, which we were just talking about, is coming out in paperback this year. And it is also the winner of an Andre Norton Nebula Award. So major congratulations for that as well. She also writes for publications, including the Washington Post and Tor.com. And she lives in Philadelphia with her husband, daughter, dog, and <clears throat> a loud parakeet. It was an all caps, so I had to make sure to emphasize that. And then Jonathan, as many of you know, is a great friend of the store, and he's the creator of Joe Ledger, Rotten Moon, as well as many other titles, and a Bram Stoker Award-winning author. Now, on that note, the house rules, everyone. As you can tell, you are all saying hello, so hello back. Keep the love coming. We will say hello back to you in the comments. And then if you look down below where it says ask a question, that is indeed where you can ask a question. I would highly encourage you to take advantage advantage of that. Ask the writers, poke their brains. This is your opportunity to get to interact with them, which is the best part of the events. And then also, give me one second to get it up, but there will be a magical button that will appear in three seconds where you can purchase the books of the authors tonight. Aha, there it is, like magic. And so if you wish to purchase any of the books tonight, make sure you click that button down below. On that note, enough for me. I'm going to pass it off to Jonathan, and I will see you all at the end of the event. Bye. Thank you. Is it any coincidence that the buy link matches your shirt, Jonathan? Are you trying to, like, subtly influence people towards that? I, I, I am known for myself. Yes, yes, that's what <laughs> Um, so hi, it's it's good to see you again. And Hello. Uh, congratulations on the book. Uh, Thank you. I've, uh, it's a book I've, I've given to a few friends who have kids, and they're digging it. So it's oh uh, my gosh! Thank you yeah. so much. Uh, it, it's nice when when kids when you give a book, and it, you know sometimes kids are like ah thanks, and then they read it and they're like oh wow cool. So I've gotten some of those replies, and that's pretty oh, great. Cool. Yeah, I hope they tell all their friends too. I like this I, is a really fun book, but it's also like super great for summer. And mm -hmm. it's, it's it's a summertime book. It's it, it could also be a wintertime book if if you know you're in a hot climate. But so, so I want to start off with with a just kind of a fundamental question: What drew you to the genre of science fiction? I mean, like who were your influences, and um, just talk about why you're in that space. You're pretty so, solid. In that space. <laughs> I have always loved to read. I mean, most most writers that you talk to start out as readers. And um, I have loved reading science fiction and fantasy ever since I was a little kid. Um, the librarians at Tradifferent East Town Library, I've always got to give them a shout out, shout out um, were great and they kept me and my imagination going. But there was also um, a bookstore in Wayne, Pennsylvania called the Reader's Forum, which is um, has has transitioned and changed, but the, the owners, the original owners kept um, advanced reader copies of science fiction uh, books for me. And I read some things that probably I shouldn't have read as like an eight or 10 year old, but there, I also learned a lot about um, books that became some of my lifelong favorites. Um, Natalie Babbitt's Tuck Everlasting uh, is one. The Phantom Tollbooth, which I talk about all the time is another. And the Phantom Tollbooth in particular is important because that's a portal narrative. And when I write children's fantasy, for the most part, I'm writing portal fantasies. Mm -hmm. um, and I write a lot of different types of genre fiction. I love experimenting with it. It's it's like a palette that I like to paint different things with. And, and depending on what I'm writing about, I write and use different tools and different methods. But 
Um, with The Ship of Stolen Words in particular, it's a, almost a reverse portal fantasy because normally the main protagonist goes through the portal and has adventures and learns things and then brings that knowledge back to the world where they came from, but they're trying to solve a problem um, at the same time. So the, um, the Phantom Toolbooth, the problem they're solving is boredom because Milo is just heavily bored, if I can quote John Berryman in a, in a discussion about kids' books. Um, but in Peter Pan, the problem is growing up and not wanting to grow up. And Wendy you know, goes out at, with her brothers and has adventures and then comes back. Um, and that's kind of a portal fantasy. But The Ship of Stolen Words actually has two sides to it because there are two narrators and they mm -hmm. both go through the portals from either side which makes it even more exciting. And I just, I grew up loving adventures. I grew up loving reading about the impossible. And um, luckily I grew up in Philadelphia, which is a great place for science fiction and fantasy. It had, um, it has a wonderful history with Isaac Asimov and um, Gardner Dozois, who was writing just these incredible collections of science fiction anthologies that I was reading as a kid. Michael Swanwick is here. Um, Jonathan Mayberry was here for a little while, but then he left us and went to the West Coast. Gregory Frost. Um, I just like really grew up in a very rich area for science fiction and fantasy, and I always felt very lucky. And Lloyd Alexander was right down the road from me as a kid, and I had no idea. So it, yeah. it was pretty cool. That is that that is that is fantastic. Yeah. Um, so uh, you're best known for the Bone Universe. Um, yeah. So talk about that and and you know it, its creation and, and the books that you wrote in that world. So Updraft was the first book in the Bone Universe. I conveniently have it right here. Um, and I wrote a short story um, at a writing workshop where I had gone. It was the first time I had sort of given myself permission after my daughter was born and she was old enough um, to go back into writing. I had, I, I was um, working as a game developer, computer designer, web designer, lots of different things, but I wasn't writing, writing. And so I went to a workshop on um, Martha's Vineyard called Viable Paradise. Um, which is a great place to go for a week and, and write with your peers. And one of the challenges was to write a short story in the span of about 12 hours um, based on some different things that are, you know, top secret. I can't tell you what's happening. Um, but I had just been in this huge discussion with one of the instructors there about um, great fight scenes and also, um, Paradise Lost and John Milton. And this is a long way of saying that I managed to cram my entire English honors thesis into a science fiction story because Updraft started as a sort of fall from heaven, pandemonium, Paradise Lost um, sort of not offshoot, but it has some bones to it that are in there. I, I drew a family tree for updraft for um, the book smugglers a couple of years ago, and you can Google it. And there's all these different influences from the blog S to um, John Milton to um, the Windhover, the poem, the Windhover. And um, it is about a city of living bone that is rising above the clouds and the people that live on it fly from tower to tower on man-made wings, but they also have bridges. And so there's some bridge building going on. And the main character, Kirit, um, just wants to go out and, and start living her life. And when I started writing it, I could hear her fighting and arguing and, and she's a really great character. So I really, um, the writing kind of took off from there. And I wrote three books in that series. Um, a couple people in the audience, Ryan, I know you're out there as a, as a lifelong fan of Updraft and has been um, cheering it on for, it's been out for six years. I cannot believe it. That's, um, and that was, uh, so that was my first published novel with Tor and my second and third came out shortly thereafter. And, um, I really loved writing in this universe. Uh, I loved writing the 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 setting. The the city is actually kind of a character as yeah. well, and um, I love writing the monsters that are in it. Yeah, there's some cool monsters in that book. I just want to hug. Yeah, <laughs> Updraft is is uh, it's funny. Updraft was my favorite of your books until Ship of Stolen Words, but we're going to get to that that book in a second. No kidding. Yeah, I love that book, and and because I I got it. I think I may even have got it in Mysterious Galaxy about a year after I moved here to, to San Diego. And um, uh, I was browsing the, 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 the books there and I loved the cover. The cover hooked me and I was like, wait a minute, Fran, I know Fran. So I, I somehow had missed that you were 
that book was coming out, and I've known you forever, so that that was uh, that was a real real nice surprise, and it was a hell of a book. Um, so you also write in the gem universe, yes. and you give give folks a a, a a bit of an insight into that with with as I always say without spoilers. So the gem universe is a set of novellas and novelettes that um, came out from Tor.com, sort of interspersed in between the Bone Universe series. They're very different worlds. The gem universe is about um, people trying to live in the same world as very bad gems that kind of control different things. They, they amplify powers and talents of certain people, but not others. Others, they just drive mad. And um, so I was writing a, a fantasy world. Um, initially, I just wanted to write a short story, but it got bigger and bigger. Um, I have to say Updraft started as a short story and turned into a trilogy. Really? So I'm not a very good poet. I'm not like, I, I, one of my favorite things to say is that one of the most important parts about writing is concision. And I'm not very good at sticking to my own rules. But the gem universe is, um, tr traces long arcs of history. Whereas uh, the Bone Universe traces the lives of a certain group of characters, the Gem Universe kind of goes all over. And the first book in that series is The Jewel in Her Lapidary. And it was nominated for a whole bunch of things. Um, and it won the UG Foster Award at Dragon Con, which was really amazing. And no, it did not actually. That was a short story that did that. But uh, the, the Jewel in Her Lapidary was nominated for a lot of things. I'm so glad that this is recording. <laughs> um, and then uh, the, uh, the second book in that universe is um, called, um, it's right over there and I am, Ryan, what's it called? It's got a librarian in it. Um, it's <laughs> um, it's the um, Fire Opal Mechanism. Wow. And the reason why I'm stuttering is because the Fire Opal Mechanism is about a librarian and a thief who are in a battle against a wicked pr printing press powered by a very bad emerald. Um, and the third book in the series I have just finished very exciting um and that one is called the book of gems and it's there's no link to that one yet but um that one has uh science in it it's all science and there are some short stories too that you can find online there's the topaz marquee and um ruby singing which are both about singular gems and those are at beneath the skies well, let's go, go check those out. Yeah, I was going to ask you if there was a new novella coming out in the series, and you just answered that question for me. So my yes, uh, my my editor Patrick Nielsen Hayden at Tor.com has it, and cross your fingers that he likes it because that's what I'm hoping. Um, and eventually, you know, people have asked if there is more there, and I have um, t promised Scott Andrews at Beneath the Skies that I'll write a couple more short stories, and then maybe gather them all eventually into a a, a, a bigger omnibus collection or a ring cycle, if you will. Cool. Um, so one of my favorites of your work is the Unseely Brothers, which was on, uh, it's available actually for, to, as a free read on, on Uncanny Magazine website. Uh, it, it's, you know, I, I, you know, I love the story. The, the, it really captured me. What drew you to writing that? And will we see the uh, more of the Unseely Brothers? I um, just texted the editors in Uncanny with an idea for a second Unseelie Brothers story. Um, but the the thing is that I love dark fantasy and I had been toying with the idea of what happens again when um, the fantastical comes through the mirror into the real world and what happens if they go into business. So I thought, you know, what could possibly go wrong if the uh, the dark the dark fairies took over a uh, haute couture atelier in the middle of the um, social season social season event of the year, and um, so it's sort of a combination of Goblin Market meets New York Fashion Week, and um, things bad things ensue. But the main character's in the process of trying to find herself in all of this. And I, when I first wrote the first draft, I wasn't really sure where I was going with the end. I knew where I wanted to end up, but I wasn't sure I was gonna get there until I remembered this is a fairy tale and I can do anything and no spoilers, but it was just really fun to unpack that because fairy tales are at their heart kind of dark. They explore mm -hmm. sort of things that, um, that are sort of 
the inversion of what we normally think of as as you know normal proper behavior. Um, so I have some fairies that are working in the shop, and they have different things that um, you would you have to take a second look at. And that's part of what I really love about that story is it requires a second look. Yeah, it, and, it, and it actually holds up well to multiple reads too, which is great. Oh, um, it uh, and the funny thing about fairies is that's been so sanitized by Disney that folks forget that the original fairy, fairy tales were very dark, really sometimes like cruel and nasty dark. And uh, um, now I'm not saying that your story is that, but those characters have that edge, and that makes the story a lot more fun, a lot of fun to read. I think that's that's what I love about dark fantasy, though, is that that and I a lot of my fantasy stories do run that edge of they could go over into horror, but they you know slowly pull back. Um, clearly lettered in in a mostly steady hand definitely <laughs> goes right over that edge. But the um, the the aspect of taking something that is not necessarily neutral, good or bad, but just of a different set of intentions. Mm -hmm. Than we that than we have, and trying to figure out how you communicate across those boundaries is and, really yeah, that's and that's really that, that comes across in in a, in a lot of your stories where you have characters that are not human Earth characters. In that, um, the the there seems to be an implication that the laws that we understand aren't necessarily you know universal. Everyone has their own set of, of, of good and bad rules and ethics and so on. And that also creates a nice intellectual challenge for uh, uh, for kids who are reading that because they're learning, they're going from the, the, the chaotic freedom of being a little kid into the more structured, you know, I'm now in school and I have rules thing. And it's it's interesting for them to see that process. So um, it's and it comes part, part of being a kid and growing up is figuring out how to live in the world. Yeah. where people are doing things and, and things are happening that maybe you don't understand all the time. And um, I run a workshop for libraries sometimes called How to Build a Monster, where we put together um, a kit of monsters and, and, and we do it because um, I, asked, I asked the kids to take something that um, they, they're a little bit afraid of and mix it with something familiar and then give that thing something that it wants and something that scares it. And we build a monster kind of out of parts. And the monsters that the, the kids come up with are always so amazing. And they've always got some sort of gem of truth in them too. The what something that they're trying to figure out how to communicate with. Yeah. And I think that's kind of the function of monsters is it's a problem solving exercise, but it's also just a communication barrier and trying to get over that is a big deal. That's fantastic. So, uh, your latest book is The Marvelous Ship of Stolen Dreams, and it's it's a middle grade fantasy with some very important core messages. Without spoilers, you know, tell the, the folks who are watching about that book. So um, The Ship of Stolen Words uh, is about Sam, who has just graduated from fifth grade, and his friends and his little sister. And Sam is, you know, your typical, he loves baseball. He loves his family. He loves his half sister, Bella. She's great. Her tooth has just fallen out. She's got a lisp. He's trying to help her with stuff. But Sam kind of, you know, in the spirit of all little kids, doesn't always do the right thing. And he has figured out that he can say sorry and get out of trouble pretty easily. Mm -hmm. um, so he does it a lot. And he ends up getting in a fight with his best friend. He steps in it majorly and he goes to say, I'm sorry, and nothing comes out. And part of that is because he had crossed paths with a, a, an older woman, um, very small, slightly green, with a stick earlier that morning and who had waved her stick at him. And he hadn't noticed, but he'd lost a word. She'd stolen it from him. And his the entire story from Sam's side is the quest to get that word back and to get a lot of other words back once he discovers that the goblins have been stealing words for a long time. Um, on the other side of the story is Tulver, who is about Sam's age. They're very similar in a lot of ways. They're both very curious. And Tulver is a goblin who has been wanting to go on a word stealing expedition for a long time. And this is his first time doing this when all of these, this um, stuff happens with Sam. So 
half of the book is told from Tolver's perspective and how things that are completely normal in his world, like flying airships and floating cities and, and um, magical words that can power lighter than air things because they're, they're basically made of hot air, um, can, it, are completely normal, where in Sam's world, they're magic. And so when the worlds get crossed and, and different um, goblins come across and, and, you know, shenanigans ensue, which is kind of the subtext of the whole book is, you know, the ship of stolen words, shenanigans. Um, the, both of them have to figure out how to exist within each other's worlds in order to get their problems solved. Now, the, uh, the message that words have power and consequences is, is really strong in the book. What drew you to that topic and, and like what made you focus on that for a book? Um, I think a couple of different things. I think just um, lately there has been an awful lot of usage of words to mean whatever somebody wants at the time. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, while I think that words are pretty plastic and malleable, I also feel like it's good, it's really good to remember that they do impact other people, that they can cause different types of reactions and they're important. Um, but also at the same time, I wanted to talk about how important it is when you're acquiring language, when you're learning how to use words to be able to mess up and to be able to make mistakes and fix them. And so that was that was the most of it. The other part was that um, a friend of mine, uh, Elizabeth Bear, realized that um, I was apologizing quite a bit um, for a very long time. But there was a point where I was just, you know, all the time, I'm sorry about this, I'm sorry about that. And um, kids in our culture, and especially girls, are pretty much conditioned to dial things back and say, oh, sorry, I didn't mean that, or sorry about the weather, which is my favorite one, because who can control the weather? And so um, Bear took my sorries away for a couple weeks. He said, you're not allowed to say you're sorry. And it was really hard. Um, and I learned a lot there. And I just realized that, that what, what would happen, a lot of my stories start off with a big what if. And this was what if goblins came and stole a kid's sorries. And I started working with that and then, and Sam was great, I really enjoyed Sam, but then Mrs. Malloy, his fifth grade teacher appeared and she's really important to the story because she's great and supportive and fantastic, but goblins had stolen a word from her years beforehand. And so when the goblins appear in the beginning, and I don't think it's a spoiler just because um, I've talked about this before, but they're, they appear out of a little free library. And the Little Free Library is very important to the whole story and it kind of gets destroyed a lot. But the first time they appear, Sam is walking home with his teacher and his teacher sees the goblins, which adults never see this stuff, but she does. She believes him. More than that, she's like, let's go get these guys. <laughs> and that's, I think that was really just super fun to write an adult that believes kids. Yeah. And, and it, it's, it's such a great book. Will we get? Are we getting a sequel? I would love to do a sequel. That would be so much fun. Now, do you envision it? Envision if you do. Do you envision it as a um, a series or a trilogy? I um in in the back of my mind, I envision it as sort of an ongoing saga with different generations. But I want to write Mason's story. I think Mason is a great character. She's mm -hmm. she's really into math. She's really smart, and you know her. And her identity kind of revolves around being smart. So I'm wondering what the goblins could steal from her. Uh, I have a guess, but we'll see. Nice. Now, I, one of the things that, that has drawn me to your fiction, and uh, both long and short, is, is a, there's a very lyrical quality to it. Um, it's, it's there in, in, in sentence structure. It's there in the, uh, the figurative language. So uh, what is, and I know you've studied poetry too, so you can talk about that. But what is it about poetry that appeals to you as a novelist? Um, well, you're right. I did. I studied poetry in undergrad, and then I took my MFA in poetry um, at Warren Wilson College. Mm -hmm. And I had the great luck to study with um, poets who are also fiction writers on occasion. Um, but uh, like Pete Turchi was there. He wrote The Cartography of the Mind, which is a, a writing book that's great. Um, but I, I, over the years, I studied with Rita Dove. I studied with Larry Levis. Um, Ellen Bryant-Voigt, Heather McHugh, and um, 
my thesis advisor uh, ended up being Larry Levis and then Joan Alshire after Larry died. And it was just this really intense deep dive into um, writers who did heavy lifting with very few words. I wrote my thesis on um, Elizabeth Bishop's One Art and a Louise Glick poem and, uh, uh, that was about Hansel and Gretel actually. So I was writing my thesis on genre even then and a George Oppen poem, which George Oppen is kind of a poet's poet. But the, um, the, the, the topic was about how language acts as a hinge between understanding and revelation between um, where we are and where we want to be. And it sort of is a transformational thing. Um, and poetry does like flash fiction. We were talking a little bit about flash fiction earlier. Poetry allows you to ask words to do heavier lifting um, than people think that it does. Po poems often expect words and lines and punctuation and white space to do more than one thing at a time. And in fact, the the, the strongest and, and most impactful things often do three or four things at a time, which I love. Yeah, one of the, speaking of, of the power of poet, poetry for, for novels, one of the, the best bits of advice I ever got, I got from uh, Ray Bradbury when I was a kid, that um, you should read poetry to yourself or read it aloud every day. And I do that I, actually every day before I write, I read poetry aloud. And it has informed the way I write, not only in, in you know, the things you've mentioned, but also in, in the, the brevity of getting a message across without having to, to lump 10,000 words on top of it to beat, beat uh, the, the point to death. And you really get to the point a lot in your stories. And uh, I noticed that also changes depending on which character's point of view there is. I find found the goblin to be a little more poetic in, in structure than than Sam was. I well, I I mean part of part of the challenge, as you know, and I'm going to ask you a question in a minute. Uh, part of the challenge is to when you're doing multiple POVs, is to write in two two different voices. You mm -hmm. don't want your characters to sound the the same at all. So I really worked with Sam's cadence and the words that he used and the way that he talked, and then had to make some decisions about Pulver and how he spoke too. And I realized that Tolver's um, language was definitely a little bit more lyrical. Um, and I, I mean, I did that with uh, the Bone Universe too. And pretty much every um, every character I write, I sit down and think, you know, what are their favorite words? Why are they? so important you know do they talk in short sentences or long sentences predominantly yeah. um, and why and that's a really fun thing to do that, one of the the things i love about of writing fiction and reading fiction by people who understand the science of it as well as the art of it is the fact that it, if something reads you know seamlessly just reads with flow it does it, it's kind of like like a song or, or a piece of dance that ease comes from all the work that went into creating that moment of, of flow. It isn't just that's how it first comes out. And that, that shows, you know, the craftsmanship is really, really a lot of fun. Um, now, a couple, a couple of questions from, uh, that have been posted here. Uh, what scene or section brought, uh, brought you the most joy to write in, in this book? Um, well, I can't, I'm not going to tell you any of the end scenes, which I loved. No, that, no, no, that I, yeah, no, spoilers. Um, but my favorite scene towards the beginning of the book is um, when Sam and Miss Malloy see the goblins for the first time. And Sam almost gets pulled into the little free library and there's a struggle and mm -hmm. then they all fall out again. And that was just really fun to write. Um, and then my next favorite scene is also involves, almost all of them involve the little free library um, where more stuff happens and Sam ends up going through into the other side, but it's not in an expected way and there are unexpected consequences to it. I mean, I think also I really liked writing Bella every time Bella was in a scene, she just kind of lit it up. And because she wasn't, she wasn't, she was real. She wasn't, you know, the cute or annoying little sister. She was just a, a character and so fascinating in, in, a, in to write a younger character that had just so much curiosity and could get into so much trouble with so little effort. Will, um, we, will we get a, a Bella story, short story at least? I, 
I would really love to do that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and Megan, if there is, you know, a little place to put a Bella short story on uh, Abrams uh, website, I might do that. That would be fun. Fantastic. Um, another question we have uh, posted here. Is there anything you have to do, you had to do to switch between being in the headspace for writing a kid's book or writing something for adults? Yes. <laughs> and if, when I, when I think back um, to when I was finishing the ship of stolen words, I love that mug, by the way, that's fantastic. Um, mm -hmm. It was, uh, I, I had, I had a pretty substantial revision to do. Um, mm -hmm. My, my editor asked me for something that was pretty tough, but I'm so glad that she trusted me with it and that she thought Fran's totally capable of doing this. And I was like, yes, give me this. But I was also finishing the book of gems um, at the same time. And I, and I was teaching classes too. So it was a lot. Um, and I ended up sequestering certain hours of the day where I work on one book and a certain place where I will work on it. And then I would get up and move and work on the second book, um, which one was in revisions and one was still in development. So it was completely different mental processes. But I was I was working in different places so that my brain would sort of store what I was writing about um, yeah. for that place. You, I don't know that I could write two kids books at the same time. I really don't. And I tend to use the space between books to sort of clear the air. So this was new for me. Um, but I just by doing that, by sort of sequestering the time and the space between the the like writing one thing in the morning and writing one thing in the afternoon really helped. Um, the thing to remember and the thing that I, I talk about a lot with my students is that when you're writing a kid's book, you're writing for kids. You're not writing at them and you're not, you know, they, they're your audience. And the promise that you make for them is the same promise that you make for any other reader, which is I'm not going to waste your time. I'm going to give you a really fun experience or I'm going to give you a really transformative experience. And it's going to be something that you're going to be glad to have done. And so um, you kind of have to set yourself aside, your ego aside when you're doing that to make sure that that happens. Yep. Now we have a question from an educator too. Uh, uh, Robin Marks asks, has, have your books been translated into other languages? And if so, what? Um, so Updraft has been translated into other, other languages. Um, in, it's in German. And a lot of my short stories are in other languages. I have short stories in Chinese, Polish, Hebrew, um, nothing in French yet, which is concerning to me. And there, um, there, there are a lot of hopeful opportunities down the road, but nothing yet for um, Ship of Stolen Words. So cross your fingers. Yeah, I have my fingers crossed on that. Not um, Spanish yet. No, I would love to have it in Spanish. Yeah, we we I would especially with the number of kids here in this country who who are bilingual. You know that that would be fantastic. Um, another question from from a Mysterious Galaxy Bookstore: Was there a moment uh, for you where things clicked and you knew being a writer was what you wanted to do for the rest of your life? Oh man, I've been having this conversation with a lot of people today. <laughs> um, so I realized probably later than a lot of other people realized. Um, and Julia, if you're listening, I'm going to steal the phrase that we we came up with this morning. But I realized I'm a rainbow stacker. Um, and my friend clarified this by saying when she was a little kid, she like got that toy that's made up of rainbow colored rings. And she worked really hard to get the rainbows stacked appropriately. And then when she figured out how to do it, she's like, OK, that I, I figured that out. I'm going to move on now and never had any interest in the toy again, which was brilliant. And I'm, Julia, I'm so sorry, I'm using your story, but I'm, I'm grasping at this. I realized, and I think this is true of a lot of writers, that I love solving problems. And I love figuring things out much more than the repetition of doing it again. And a lot of times what happens with me is I do something until I have achieved mastery of it, and then I move on. Well, in writing, I kind of, hit the one thing that you can never achieve mastery of. You can you can learn how to write a book, but when you're finished with that book, you've got to learn how to write the next book and the next book after that. So when that clicked, I think, I think it was the first time that a story kind of rang like a bell, that mm -hmm. moment where you know that you got it right and you stuck the landing and the whole thing just holds together enough to make an actual sound. And when I did that for the first time, I was just a goner. 
Like that was that was what I wanted to keep doing. And Updraft did that. And then just, yeah, over and over again. Sometimes things take a long time to write. Um, sometimes I write multiple drafts of them. And sometimes I hit that story and it's, you know, it's I know where I know where it sounds. And yeah. that's really important. Fantastic. So uh, if anyone's, you know, buying a ship of, of stolen words or any of your other books, um, what else should they, they buy, whether they're going to a brick and mortar bookstore or online? Uh, what, what is a real like or at least a, a book that sits comfortably on the same shelf as your works? That is a great question. Um, I think, well, Greg Van Eekhout's books, um, Cog especially is great and fantastic. Um, I love the books with the dogs in space as well. And he's got a new book coming out soon, which would be fantastic. Um, it's not middle grade, but I have to I have to mention Darcy Little Badger's Elastaway, which just won the Locus Award last night, which is really, really tremendous. And it's fantastic. Um, I love, um, so many books right now, and I'm trying to think of how to get them all into one sentence so it doesn't sound like um, I am I'm completely living down the the whole topic. But um, I think something that I've really loved lately is I'm reading a lot of graphic novels, and oh, yeah. so um, the Magic Fish is just a fantastic gra graphic novel. It has a fairy tale aspect to it. It's beautifully illustrated. I know it is a Mysterious Galaxy favorite because I've seen it on your Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a fantastic, beautiful, beautiful book. Um, Chuck Wendig has a uh, middle grade coming out in October called Dust and Grimm, which mm -hmm. is just um, kind of, it's really amazing and stunning and surprising and all of those things. Um, but I really enjoy He's another that. Eastern Pennsylvania guy. Yes, he is. He is. He's, he's great. Um, I always, always stand for Kate Milford's books. Um, she wrote Green Glass House, which is one of my favorites, just beautiful, like yeah. writing riddles all over the place. If anyone was going to go back in time and rewrite the Western game, it would be Kate Milford. She is just a beautiful writer. And um, she wrote one of my favorite boat books of all time outside of the Wizard of Earthsea, which is my favorite boat book of all time. Um, it's called The Left-Handed Fate. And it is just stunning, and it's got the history of Baltimore, and there's a little bit of Fels Point in there, and I really love that. Um, I am thinking of so many different books right now that um, are not kids' books. So sitting on a shelf comfortably um, is a little bit strange, but... Or in the same shopping bag going out of the store. How's that? Okay. <laughs> um, definitely not in the category of kids' books. This is much more... Um, adult books, but Wendy Darling by A.C. Wise, uh, which is a retelling of a portal narrative, but it's also kind of crossed with lots of different things. Um, if you've read Circe uh, by Madeline Miller, also Circe by Madeline Miller, fantastic book, another Philadelphian. Um, you might sense the, the East Coast tilt here, um, but it's, it's just a really good look at fairy tales from an adult point of view. And um, also the other thing that I'm reading right now that I'm having a really good time with is uh, Carrie Vaughn's Questland. Oh, and yeah. that just came out from John Joseph Adams books and it is uh, amazing and I'm having so much fun with that. Um, and Rebecca Roanhorse's uh, Black Sun, I keep recommending that um, over and over again. Um, can I do one more? Yeah, of course. Um, Sarah Monette, who wrote The Goblin Emperor, the next book in that collection just came out and it oh, is so grand. Yes, it's wonderful. It. Cool. Now, two uh, more uh, unusual questions. Um, since you, you you know have an MFA in poetry, uh, but you write prose, have you ever considered doing a story or novel in prose like, like, like Ellen Hopkins does with, with her books? You ever thought about doing a story in prose? Or story in verse, rather? I have written one in verse. Um, it is um, something that I needed to take back and work on some more. But yes, I, I, love, I love what verse does. Um, I also would love to try writing a graphic novel because I think that that intersection of illustration and words is a really great crossroads. Um, but I don't know that I have actually told you this, but I have a 
poetry collection coming out from oh, a, sm a small press called Lanternfish Press in August. Um, so that's that's pretty exciting too. Um, oh, so cool. Yeah, they did a cool thing. They asked me if I would illustrate it as well. So the cover art is mine. It's There's lots of stuff that is gonna come out pretty soon. Right, I knew you that, were I didn't know you were that artist. collection is, uh, that's been in process since I was 21. So oh, it is. Cool. It has a long arc. I started the. I started writing those poems, or some of them, when um, I was still in the MFA. I took a break. Uh, put, you know, helped my husband uh, go through his PhD program. Had a daughter. Did a lot of other jobs, and then picked up all of those poems in 2016 or 2017 when I was suddenly writing poetry again because I was so mad at things, and um, looked at them and thought these aren't very good at all. These are terrible. <laughs> and so I went back and I rewrote a lot of them and I had some friends look at them. Um, Julia Rios was a tremendous freelance editor, took a look at them as well and um, sat down with me. I was like, well, what are you actually trying to say here? Because what you're saying and what you're really wanting to say are two different things. And that's not something I'm familiar with, with your prose, mm -hmm. but you're, you know, this poetry here that you're doing in the older stuff, especially had so much enigmatic qualities to it. And so she really, you know, kicked my butt a little bit and got me to settle down and, and say what I really meant. And that was um, a process of a couple years. And when I mentioned to some people that I had a poetry collection, Lantern Fish Press, um, can't say enough good things about them. They're a, a small operation in Philadelphia and they do beautiful, beautiful books. Um, they did uh, Theodora Goss's um, collection of monstrous women um, just recently, that's just fantastic. And a Carmen, Mach a Carmen Machado um, retelling of an old story called Carmilla. And mm -hmm. they just do beautiful, beautiful things. So they're they're doing one of mine in August. Fantastic. Now, um, you've got a you have a story coming out in my next issue of Weird Tales. Yes. And it's a it's a it's an issue that's that's heavily slanted toward female writers, Heather Graham, Omakatsu, Priya Sharma. Oh my uh, gosh. Uh, Yvonne Navarro and you. Uh, without spoilers, what can you tell folks about your story? Um, so it's a what if. What if two um, mountaineering influencer sisters uh, who lived by from broadcast to broadcast of all of their adventures met up with something bad and terrible and couldn't get out of it? What would happen? Um, and there, I had a lot of fun with it. When you challenged me to write this story, um, mm -hmm. I was like, well, I want to write, I want to try cosmic horror. I've never written a cosmic horror before. And it turns out I'm, I really enjoy it, um, in part because it's, it is that idea of the monstrous, but the scale is off the hook. It just goes everywhere. Yeah, I think people are going to be really surprised when they read it because, I mean, you seem like a nice person. And then you <laughs> <like> that. <laughs> so that was, uh, I remember reading that. I'm like, this is, you know, I had to check. This is actually Fran's story. Okay. You know, it got, she went weird on me. Um, so a, a couple of quick questions. We don't have a whole lot of time. So a couple of quick questions. First, where can people find you online? You can find me online at Fran Wild, W I L D E. Dot net. That's my website. I'm also on Twitter and Instagram as Fran underscore wild. Um, and then I have a Facebook page as well called for, that is facebook.com slash Fran Wild Writes. But all of those are linked from franwild.net. I also have a Patreon um, and I'm generally uh, lurking around Instagram and posting pictures of my dog, Luna. Um, the, the rule used to be whenever she ate a leash or a collar or her bed or a toy or a small woodland creature, she would have to pose with a friend's book as advertising fees, but um, she's gotten much better, but she still likes to pose with books. So um, occasionally we do that. Cool. Now, I know you're a fan like I am of brick and mortar bookstores. Yes. What is it about indie bookstores that appeals to you? Why should readers go there rather than just the more convenient shopping online thing? What's, what's the charm? Well, I mean, the, the, it's it's a real person who is recommending books to you, um, who loves books themselves. Algorithms don't love books. People <laughs> love books. And I think that that's one of the most fantastic things about bookstores is you can wander in there and stay for hours and have a great conversation and come out with several books that you didn't even know you needed, but you definitely needed them. The booksellers in books in in brick and mortar independent bookstores do so much wonderful work, 
And sometimes it's just, oh yes, and I know that you have a friend who, who is doing X or Y, would you like to try this? I got handed H for Hawk because of that. And I'm so glad, I'm so grateful to the person who, did, who gave that to me. Um, yeah. And it's, just, it's kind of um, like serendipity is, mm -hmm. is you know, what you're looking for. You find something else because what you're looking for is so hard to find it, but it's also not like serendipity because the booksellers at your independent bookstore know exactly where to find what you need. Yeah, one, one, of, uh, one of the guys at, at Mysterious Galaxy, Rob, is uh, he told me about a book that I had never heard of and should have heard of, um, uh, Ballad of Black Tom by, by Victor Laval. And oh, it's look good, it's so I, good. I love that so much that when I, got the gig to edit weird tales the very first person i contacted was victor laval oh no so, kidding yeah so i mean he turned me on to a writer who was just about to explode and yeah. that's something you don't get when you go to the antiseptic you know it, the box stores where they can tell you where it's shelved but not about the book or you know about the writer right. or, or you know the, the bigger the giant in the room um where it's it's recommendations because of because of algorithms but not heart and books real real bookstores have real heart and, and real bookstores each have their own personality. Yeah. You are definitely going to a place that is very loved and very much um, curated to, yeah. to to the personality of the community. Like it's it's a it's a huge cornerstone in most communities to have an independent bookstore. It really is, and uh, it, it's, it's kind of like having a dragon, except yes. you get books instead of yeah. dragons. Yeah. <laughs> Less fiery breath. Warner. That was that was that metaphor was doing so well, and then it went right off the rails. <laughs> yeah, well, well we one. we have a not official mascot, but we do have a dragon that appears on many of our mugs and whatnot. So it actually ties in very very well. Misty is our is our dragon that you will see throughout the whole store. I collect independent bookstore mugs, actually, and so I will have to get a mug from you guys with my dragon up here, who is who travels with me. Because you know, if you're, if you're a science fiction fantasy writer, you should have a dragon. You should. I, I can't argue with that at all. I wholeheartedly support it, 110 percent. And you guys are so amazing, Jonathan and Fran are beyond amazing. So. I don't even have anything to add because they said all of the amazing, wonderful things you could possibly say about supporting local stores. And on that point too, Turnabout is fair play. Um, we have amazing authors and we get to keep having amazing authors like Jonathan and Fran because you buy their books and you actually support the authors. So if you want more books from amazing authors, you also got to buy their books and support them as well. So we got to give the love back on all fronts and make sure that you keep on buying their books as well, because that's how we get to keep on getting more books from the amazing authors. So Jonathan, was there anything else that you wanted to add? I, I want to make sure I didn't cut off any questions or anything that you had. No, no, I, actually, I, this, this timed out real well. This, this, that was the last question I had. And we also addressed the questions that were posted. So uh, thanks to everyone who, who attended and asked questions. And yeah. Go buy this book. It's fantastic. You're going to fall in Yay. love with, with, with that story and with and you're going to want to read more of Fran's work. So please, you know, take that step. Have fun. Thank you all so much. These were fantastic questions. Yay. And yes, I was about to say ship of words. And I was like ship of stolen words is on our shelves as well as um, Fran's other works. I know we've had them since they've come out and they've been popular as well as Jonathan's work. So thank you all so much for hanging out this Monday evening with us. We will see you all next time. Thank you so much, Fran. Thank you so much, you. Jonathan. Thanks, and have a lovely evening, everyone. Goodbye. Bye, Bye. guys.